But what we want to talk about today is specifically what is happening with the metering devices. Notice I've painted this blue and this red because it's always that same way. But I didn't paint this line. Even though it's always vapor, during heating mode, it's high pressure vapor going that way. In cooling mode, it's low pressure vapor going this way. But either way, it's superheated vapor going back and forth. Now notice this line between the metering devices, I painted it red. At that point, it's always, always, always going to be a liquid, a subcool liquid between those two points. Always, always, always. Now notice that even though we change directions, my liquid is flowing this way in the wintertime and my liquid is flowing this way in the summertime, it's still liquid between these two points. Now here I didn't paint it because in the wintertime, as we're flowing liquid this way, this is where my pressure drop is because my metering device is here. This is going to be low pressure refrigerant. And notice I painted it red all the way up to this point, but after that point, it's going to change. It could be low pressure, it could be high pressure, depending on which way it's flowing. But this line is always going to be liquid refrigerant. Now let's focus on how these metering devices are allowing that bypass and how they're allowing it to be metered. This is an example of a fixed orifice metering device. And this particular manufacturer incorporates their fixed orifice metering device for their outdoor heat pump in with the service valve. So notice this is your liquid line. This is a type of flare fitting. This is your service valve. And on the back side over here is our service port. So what they've done is allow it to be when it's in heat pump mode and refrigerant is flowing in this direction towards the outdoor unit. It takes this fixed orifice and it shoves it up very firmly inside of this hole. Now all of the refrigerant for the whole entire system has to flow through that fixed orifice metering device and that's what's metering refrigerant through that hole down through the system allowing flash gas then we have our saturated mixture moving on to the outdoor unit. In regular air conditioning mode refrigerant is now flowing in this direction up through this valve and it takes this fixed orifice piston and it shoves it this way but notice how it doesn't fit very tightly at all and the reason for that is by design. If you notice there's these little bitty grooves on this fixed orifice metering device, that means refrigerant is flowing around that metering device and through the metering device like it's not even there. So the refrigerant bypasses, by design, bypass that metering device, flows past through our liquid line and continues on to our indoor unit. So some things I want to point out with this is this metering device just simply moves this way, engages in heating mode when refrigerant's going this direction. And then in this mode, it simply disengages. It's a, somewhat loose, allows that refrigerant to bypass like it's not even there. But right here is a rubber O-ring that connects some of these pieces. So you want to make sure that when you're brazing on this, you don't overheat and melt that rubber O-ring. As well as in the service valve itself, there's another O-ring right here. So to make sure we don't overheat that O-ring as well. So we want to make sure we protect all of this with some type of wet rags or heat absorbing paste to make sure that we don't overheat these fittings when we're working on it. Also notice that right here is a screen, a mesh screen, a very fine mesh screen. The whole idea behind this mesh screen is to filter or could prevent the contaminants from getting hung up inside the metering device when refrigerant's going this direction. It's not a save all because as refrigerant changes direction, it pushes the contaminants out back the other direction, but at least it's something to protect that metering device. The screen can also clog up with restrictions such as brazing without nitrogen and you end up with oxidation in the lines and that screen can clog up and give you symptoms of a bad metering device, even though the metering device may be okay. So those screens do a very important job even though it's possible for it to loosen all that everything it catches in the other mode. But simply in heat pump mode, we're flowing refrigerant in this direction into position, and then we have saturated refrigerant. This would all be blue, low pressure, low temperature, a saturated mixture with refrigerant boiling from a liquid to vapor to the outdoor coil. Then in AC mode, all of this is going to be red, high pressure, and it's pushing that refrigerant through here. It pushes this where it's disengaged like it's not even there. Goes through the mesh, continues on through the liquid line, all the way to our liquid line filter dryer to the indoor metering device. So on the inside, if you see some type of a connection like this, there's typically a fixed orifice or a piston metering device behind it. And in AC mode, the refrigerant's flowing in this direction through the liquid line to our metering device. What that does is shoves this metering device up against this machine groove. 
This model has a little Teflon seal that also assists it. So the metering device is shoved up into that point and all the refrigerant is metered through the fixed orifice, the fixed hole on the inside. And on this side is gonna be low pressure saturated mixture. About 25% flash gas, 75% liquid refrigerant. The flash gas drops the temperature of the remaining liquid. And then you continue to the evaporator to where you're boiling that refrigerant from a liquid vapor and absorbing heat. So it's pretty simple. We have a little screen here, it pushes through and it's a very simple process. Now we go into heat pump mode, we're sending hot gas through the indoor coil, but that refrigerant changes from a vapor back to a liquid. All that's gonna be high pressure liquid refrigerant traveling in this direction. So what that high pressure liquid does is it pushes this fixed orifice meter device back the other direction. Now on this back side, it doesn't seal very well. Notice all these grooves that we have. That allows the refrigerant to go through these grooves bypassing the meter device like it's not even there. It then travels through this little mesh screen and then it continues on through the liquid line all the way through the liquid line filter dryer into the meter device outside. So when we're in heat pump mode, the indoor meter device is bypassed like it's not even there. When we go to AC mode, it then shoves this fixed orifice piston all the way up into this side and now it's metering refrigerant. So in AC mode, the indoor is metering refrigerant and then in heat pump mode, the indoor is bypassing like it's not even there. So notice how simple this metering device is. There's just simply that one piece that moves back one way for heating and back to the way for cooling. And because it has the ability to move back and forth, that's how it got the name Piston. It's a very simple metering device and it's very cheap to manufacture, but is it the best metering device? Well, a lot of technicians think so because they found that it's very easy, it never fails. And if you're looking at just the metering device alone, it could be easy to think, oh, that's a better metering device because it never fails. But if we look at the big picture, if we look at the whole side of what's happening, we have a different answer. That fixed over meeting device cannot control the superheat in the system. In AC mode, as the outdoor temperature rises, we have more pressure pushing more refrigerant through that meeting device. That affects how much liquid refrigerant in the evaporator. The indoor temperature and the indoor humidity of a running system is also going to affect how fast that refrigerant boils from a liquid to vapor inside of this evaporator coil. That's why in the summertime, we need the target superheat chart with the outdoor dry bulb and the indoor wet bulb to find out where our superheat is going to be. So if we look at a condition to where we have a 95 degree outdoor day and the customer is keeping it inside at 73 degrees at say 50% relative humidity. If you put that into the app or the target superheat chart or if you use the old school formula, you'll find that the target superheat is down there below five. It's gonna be actually below zero. So that means that if the system under those conditions was working correctly, we'll have flooded the evaporator with liquid refrigerant. That liquid refrigerant is going to flow through all the way over to our compressor and could kill a compressor or at least damage it by washing all the oil away from the bearings. Luckily, in this scenario, we have a suction line accumulator. So it's gonna protect the compressor from any liquid refrigerant flowing all the way through. But what happened in AC mode if our outdoor temperature was 67 degrees and our indoor return air wet bulb was 76 degrees? There's some odd situations, but if you did your formula, target super or use the app, you would see our target super would be, our target super would be 40 degrees. That means we have very little refrigerant coming here and we're boiling off very fast and now we've superheated this vapor. So we're actually doing very little cooling. And the problem with that is even with the suction line accumulator, we end up with a very high amount of super by the time we get to our compressor there's not gonna be enough refrigerant to cool the compressor. High superheat, which is a big cause of compressor failure. It actually cooks the compressor. So if our superheat gets too high going into the compressor, our superheat's gonna to be too high coming out of the compressor and we're looking at compressor damage. So superheat being controlled is very important to the compressor. The superheat gets too low, we have liquid flood back to our compressor, we wash out the oil from the bearings, we try to compress the liquid, we have compressor damage. If our superheat gets too high, we end up overheating and cooking our compressor and that's not good either. So even though this metering device is very simple, it has no way of controlling the superheat in the inside coil. Now, if we think about heat pump mode, we're operating the opposite direction. We still have similar factors of our house is gonna be very warm. We're pushing a lot of refrigerant over here to our outdoor coil. But if we think about the outdoor temperature, it's gonna fluctuate greatly. As the outdoor temperature gets lower and lower and lower, we're gonna be pushing more liquid through here, 
through that thick Topher's media device. And that media device cannot control the flow of refrigerant. So it's very easy for us to flood or overfill the outdoor coil or the evaporator coil in this mode. So it's essential that we have a suction line accumulator with a thick Topher's media device for the outside because it's very likely we won't be able to boil all that refrigerant to a vapor and we want to protect the compressor from liquid flood back, which sounds fine, that's a great solution. But what happens is those conditions change and we end up with a very high amount of superheat. Now we're boiling all the refrigerant from a liquid to vapor very quickly. Maybe it's cooler inside and now it's warmer outside, which is a very likely possibility. And then we end up having too much superheat out here because the thick Topher's can't control it and our superheat gets too high to the compressor and we don't have any cooling going on for the compressor. And we end up with compressor failure because the compression ratio gets too high, superheat coming in is too high, superheat coming out is going to be even higher and we end up cooking the compressor. So these thick Topher's media devices are very popular with technicians because the metering device itself is unlikely to fail. However, it has consequences on the rest of the system, mainly being compressor, but also performance of what's happening in the evaporator coil and performance of what's happening in the outdoor coil in the wintertime. What's a better option? If only we had a metering device that could adjust and open and close and keep the right amount of superheat for us. Well, I'm glad you asked because that's a thermostatic expansion valve. Some people call it a TXV, some people call it a TEV, but it's a thermostatic expansion valve and its job is to control within range, try to control the amount of superheat in the evaporator cool to open and close to keep the right amount of refrigerant boiling from a liquid to vapor. So we have the right amount of superheat to a compressor so we don't have liquid flood back and it opens so that we don't end up having too much superheat so we don't burn the compressor up. And ideally, we could also put in a TXV on the outdoor coil. And by doing that, we could also adjust the superheat outside so we could open and close to maintain the correct amount of superheat. Let's take a look.